Hello, my name is Chas Jones. I'm here on the battlefield of Fulford and I'm recording this because in a few days time this battlefield might be destroyed because the planners are deciding then that they should turn this area into a road. First of all I'm going to show you on the model and then we'll actually pan out to the landscape. What we have on the, on the, on the 20th of September 1066 is we have the English army has found itself an excellent defensive position all the way along this wonderful ditch that we call Germany Beck that was carved out by the last ice egg. This is where it breaks through the moraine down to the River Ouse. The city of York is over there. With the Earls, the Northern Earls in place, led by a chap called Earl Morcar and the Northumbrian army, he is waiting there for King Harold Hardrada and his army. And these armies come and they line up on the other side of the ford to oppose them. They can't for the moment actually engage because this is a tidal river and this is in the morning of the 20th that is absolutely full of water so while this army is assembling they've had to walk about three hours from a place called Rickle and they busily assemble there. What they can't see while they're here and what we discovered when we started to do the sort of landscape reconstruction to make this model is that there was another key bit of the army, King Harold Ardrada's army his best men, as he describes them in the sagas, are concealed down behind there. So as the battle starts, we have the two people along either side of the ditch. As the water subsides round about midday, the two armies are able to engage. And this is the army that moves first. What I want to do now is I want to show you the amazing landscape, because this is almost unchanged since the time of the battle in 1066. We are standing on the old ford and if you pan around there you can see where the traffic is running. This is the old fording area. Over in the distance there you can see a road. That is the old road through Water Fulford that used to lead right the way down to the fording place which is almost directly beneath my feet where I've got the model right now. If we look over the other side we can actually see a little bit of the landscape which has been entirely unaltered since 1066. Down at the bottom there I can still find the grey mud that used to flood in here during the battle. It would have been flooded in here on the day of the battle. Hey, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you over to look at the flanks because here there's some very steep land running along the back there so that is what stops the army coming around to the side there. Flanks are very important in ancient armies and similarly over here we've got another very very steep bank but the thing that's going to cause the whole battle to hinge is this area down here. We've got this entire area is currently waterlogged with the very high tide and remains waterlogged but the key turning point in the battle is going to be as the tide falls this bank along the, the, the edge of the ooze is going to be exposed and when that happens this army is going to come out and is going to get across the river there and make its way up behind but I'm jumping ahead. The battle started when the tide was low enough for the Vikings, probably led by Earl Tostig, who was King Harold's brother. They then set off into this muddy ford below our feet now, and they began to make their way up the other side, where they confronted Earl Morcar and his men, who very quickly began to push them backwards. At that stage in the battle, the first stage in the battle, the English really thought that they were going to win. As they say in the sagas, the English were advancing bravely. Over there we're looking at the modern the bridge that was put in to span this very great break, very steep break, which provided the right hand flank for the, the English army that was lined up all the way along that side of the beck going off into the distance. The total length of the army, the, the distance that their shield wall had to cover, was something like 400 to 500 metres. And I think, based on that, that we're looking at armies of about 6,000 on each side. We're now on the left flank of the English army. This was incredibly secure because if you follow over there you see how very steep the, the, the wall is. No warrior is going to be able to get across the ditch having crossed this fence, having crossed the marsh just beyond there. Here we are now at the very heart of the battle. This is the ditch across which the battle was fought. Over there we have the Vikings lined out along that ditch there and back over towards the ford which is about 100 metres further on. 
Over here on my right, we've got the Saxon army, but to, they're on the strong ground, they're on the high ground. To get to them, those people there have got to go, the Vikings have got to go down into the ditch, wade across this area now. You can see by the vegetation, this is very marshy, this is a peat bog, and then make their way up this side. The battle didn't start in this place, the battle started in the very centre of the, of, uh, the ford. But this is where, when the sound was, of the horn was, was given by King Harald Hardrada, all these people jumped into the ditch and made their way across. This was where the bloodiest fighting took place. The turning point in the battle came very suddenly. With Earl Morcar and the Mercians advancing very bravely in the centre of the battle, suddenly Harald Hardrada and his best men broke cover over there and started to charge along the now exposed riverbank and make their way down to get across the beck and get behind the English army. This is where King Harold Hardrada's charge would have come across the beck. We know from recent archaeological work there was a nice gentle sloping bank going down and up the other side. He'd have come down there, got on the levee, and he'd then been able to make his way up round behind the English, who would not have seen or heard or known about him until he came over the top of the moraine when he would have found them in the ditch. That's where he surrounded them, and that is where the battle started to turn very badly for the English and the records suggest that the actual battle ended towards dusk. So if it started at midday, then it could have been going on, say, at about 5, 6 o'clock when the next in rush of tide came. For those who were down in the, in the ford where we started, they would have been, if they'd still been there, they'd have been drowned. But the rather gruesome description we get from the sagas is that they, the bodies were like stepping stones, that they could have gone dry shod across the beck. And actually, this inrushing tide would have done precisely that. And it's this inrushing tide that would also have protected the English because it would have allowed, put a lot of water between the defenders and allowed them, once they got a little bit further down the retreat field, to actually separate themselves off. And then what we think we found is lots of abandoned weapons which we then, which we managed to find, which would then have also been covered up by these amazing inrushing tides. So ended the Battle of Fulford with a complete victory for Harold Hardrada. But it was a short-lived victory as five days later he would meet his fate. He would get his six feet of English earth at the Battle of Stamford Bridge.